Hello, everyone. I'm with Jackie Gamash again. I'm Jeffrey Geisner for the Obligation of Memory Podcast Network for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group on Facebook and YouTube. And we're learning a lot about Jackie's history, and we're going to kind of cover a couple things that are leading into her dedication to Holocaust education and the projects that she's working on now, which is called We Are the Tree of Life. And this is a really important project, you've, which you've spent several years of your life sort of putting together with a bunch of other very talented people. But I want to go back and you, you uh, mentioned that David's uh, stepfather was a Holocaust Auschwitz survivor. And it was, you kind of touched on that was one of the stories that you wanted to bring forward. And it was maybe one of the defining stories that started you perhaps on the path of wanting to educate on the Holocaust. And maybe you can tell our audience that story. Yes, uh, David's, stepfather, David's father was shot at the Mont Valerien in 1942 by the Germans, by the French police. That means he died like that. Uh, he was uh, he was called to the prefecture de police, to the police headquarters in Paris. He went and never came back. In fact, David went with him, with his aunt, and uh, his father never came back. That means I can imagine what that does to a kid who is four or five years old. And what year are we, uh, you know? Say that again? What year is this roughly? 1942, 1942. That means uh, he was saved then by a Christian family at the top of a mountain. They were, he was high, hidden over there and uh, à la Motte de Lancé, and which, were, which is uh, close to Grenoble. And his mother was in Grenoble and was able to visit him from time to time going up the mountain. But going back to his stepfather, who was in Auschwitz and survived Auschwitz as a doctor. And I don't want to know what it means today. Okay, I love Nathan. Uh, but I, I, I didn't want to know about the story. How does a doctor survive? That mean, that was pretty awful to me. We were married. We were living for a little bit within, uh, in the house with uh, Nathan and with David's mom. And we were going to a costume party, David and I. And I had whatever, I found whatever, but David had nothing. And Nathan came to him and said, you know, I still have my pyjama. You know what we call our pyjama from Auschwitz? Why don't you wear that? But he was saying that with all sincerity. Hmm. And David said, ah, oh, as I say, <laughs> nothing, nothing is of trouble with David. And I said, absolutely not. I, 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 can't, I can't go to a bar and the costume and you wear that and it took me years and years and years to understand how this image of this pyjama that you probably wear every day okay we never went to the wash or whatever could be reflected in a funny situation now how do you balance that with the suffering what is what is really awful is the suffering of Auschwitz inmate, right? What is a pyjama? It's nothing. What is the suffering of the yellow star? It's to wear it, to have your kids wearing it. If you have the yellow star, it's, it's an object, right? I don't know. But I mean, I couldn't understand that, not being involved in the Holocaust. Uh, but things were getting closer and closer to me, living in Paris with David's family, with the, the death of the family, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, every day I was learning that a lot of the members of his family from Poland, uh, from Lutz, were, were killed. And Again, I, and I really mean it, and I think that 
David's joyful temper comes from the fact of this suffering that he had. When for me, it was just the opposite. I was a spoiled girl, okay? And it's only <laughs> by coming to San Diego that my life become more difficult. And more difficult simply why? Because in a Sephardic way, again, uh, my kids are spread all over the country instead of living two doors away from mine. I, again, when I realized the intensity of the mission of the Lawrence Family Jewish Community Center and uh, started to do educational programs more than cultural programs, I realized with our community and the number of survivors how important was it was to bring Holocaust education. And uh, Jeffrey, uh, sometimes I sound a little bit funny and sometimes I'm very serious. We did, uh, through the publication of a book, I was the director of the former director of the San Diego Jewish Book Fair. That means we invited, we were a very successful, we were the top book fair in the country after the 10 years. And we turned this book fair into something international. That means I thought this book fair has to carry Holocaust programs. And we did it during the time of the book fair and expanded it. We, through the publication of the book itself, through the eyes of Anne Frank, we did an exhibit, an exhibit 25 feet by 25 feet of the bedroom of Anne Frank, as well as the place, I don't want to say dining room, the place where they were all eating. And uh, it was seen by most of San Diego, Jewish and not Jewish. And uh, uh, it, it went even to the Valley Center Library in the middle of nowhere, one of the county libraries. We did a, an over exhibit, the DAFCA, the survival of a people, when we had a 10 minute interview of 10 Holocaust survivors with images and a 20 minute video. What was exceptional there is that uh, it was not an, uh, in a, a recording of the survivor only, but it was a recording of the survivor with their relatives, anybody who could be present, okay, in their own living room. And that was a big difference with the Shoah Foundation exhibit over any exhibit where the, 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 the vision and the images are, and the words are essentially centered sur the survivor here. Yeah. And one of them, Fanny Lebovitz, who is known all over San Diego, you probably heard her name. She's the most beautiful woman in the world with so many of us, <laughs> not including myself, with so many of us. And uh, she was sitting next to her grandson, 17 years old, and she was telling her story. And her two sons were next to her, as well as her daughter with the children, with the children four, five, six. And the grandson at one point, when she tells the stories of her life, turns towards her and she say, Grandma, I don't understand. Why did you accept all that? Why, why, why did you survive? Why did you accept all that? And she turns towards this young man and says, I did it for you because I knew you were going to come and I did it for you. I can tell you, I don't have even to describe the atmosphere of that moment among her son and, and the youngest son said, the oldest son turns and say, why didn't you tell us the story when we were young? And the youngest say, yes, she did. What do you mean she did? She never told me anything. And that shows you how the, the, the nuances and, and, the, and the situations are sometimes in union. If she talks to one son, she talks to the other one. But it was probably a time where those survivors can talk and times when they could not talk. But she is she is absolutely incredible and 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 the 10 families that we had had exceptional story 
David was one of them. And my daughter, Yael, with her partner then, uh, with her friend Jimmy, was there. And David describes the Holocaust, and we talk about the Holocaust. And at one point, Yael, who was probably 30, 34 then, uh, turns to Jimmy, non-Jewish, who is a boyfriend or friend or partner, how do I know? And it's very difficult to know all this kind of stuff. Uh, she says, Jimmy, do you understand what we are talking about here? And the man says, I think so. She said, what do you mean you think so? That means the interlocution was not even with David anymore. It was with the other generation. And the guy was not Jewish. And she says, don't you understand? OK, let me ask you the question to be sure. If I had to be killed in a concentration camp, can you, would you try to come and try to save me? And Jimmy says, of course. And she said, why? She said, because I love you. He waits four or five seconds. He says, you know, Yael, I don't know if I would have done that, try to save you. My life would have been in danger, isn't it? You know what I'm trying to express. That means all, all those waves you know of education of learning came into me and uh, i end up by presenting the project at yad vashem okay and they love it you can you can go yad vashem dafka the survival of people and you will see the conference and when i will, always when presented it dated again when we what, what date are it's you if you go to yad vashem in you google yad vashem dafka the survival oh, of oh, a Dafka. people. D A F K A. D D as in David. A V as in Victor. K as in OK. A like in A. Dafka, which is in spite of. That's what it means. And Dafka. In what, what year? In what year did the exhibit go to Yad Vashem? Uh, two thousand and six. Okay. But if you just put that in the Yad Vashem, you, you will find it. That means. We did this DAFCA and we did we did we did a Holocaust curriculum. And when I say we, it was a team of people working together. And we did a curriculum of the Holocaust for elementary, high school, and middle school and high school. And we distributed six hundred of those binders to the city schools of San Diego. 600 binders. I have the original in my garage, but uh, that means that was becoming very important. And again, this balance between my Sephardic identity and the Holocaust, what kind of Holocaust did we leave, brought me to uh, the Shoah Foundation and to, yep. So before you go to the Shoah Foundation, I want to say, tell, me, tell us about how to put a team together that can produce this type of emotive, beautiful project? How long did it take? What were some of the learning that you took away from it? What were the some things that you wish you didn't do that you could not have done? So tell us, because our audience are doing things and they can learn from your experience. So I, I would love to have you explain some. That, that's too much, but but uh, the, the, you know we all learn from the experience of, of the other. I'm learning from you, and um, when I attend uh, your sessions, I am learning from the people who are talking. Everybody, everybody learns, but I think it's the heart, it's the love. I just do believe in love, and I will I will illustrate that. Uh, when I got the idea of DAFCA, the survival of a people. I knew I needed X thousands of dollars to do it. I was a staff of the GCC. We had a large committee and people who are on the board, who are a committee member of the film festival or the book fair or whatever, whatever. 
And when I decided to do DAFCA in spite of the survival of the people, I call up 40 of the GCC committee members who work with me on different projects. My, 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 for example, my board for the book fair was 30, 40 people. The people who do that, the people who do that, the people who do that. That means I decided, I say, if I give them something to eat at six o'clock with a good cake, I, they eat, they are all having fun. I make my presentation. We'll see what they say. And if they give an okay, we go with them again. That means the selection of the people in attendance was very important because I needed people who work with the heart and work with almost Holocaust, even if they were not Holocaust. Well, yep. how, do you, how do you, you as Jackie, make that call? How do you how do you know who is the person who works with the heart? Through their story, through their reaction, from making themselves available as many times as it was needed, from accepting, for example, in this case, to come to the dinner, uh, for people who have a sense of education and say, I, I am here as an educator and I can go further. Okay, and to if I may go back, we had those 40 people. I made my presentation in two minutes, and I don't know I'm sitting names, but I think I'm proud of that. And uh, Gert Taylor, who was, I think, a native of San Diego, very established woman, uh, has done life in San Diego. After 40 minutes at my presentation, where for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, everybody was talking. Yeah, we do it. No, we don't do it. She banged on the table and she said, Jackie needs money. She wants to do it. We are doing it. And everybody said yes. Okay. So, uh, I'll ask you a, the paradoxical question. You told us how you pick the team. How do you fire the team that doesn't work? Uh, mm, I don't have the power, I didn't have, and, and even today, I don't have the power to fire somebody because the person even who is- working, Even though they're not working well for you. Because when people do not work well and have the education and have the skills to work well, it's because they don't see the interest. It's not really the love, the dedication. It's, it's something, or, through themselves who make them say i am not happy with this job and i'm not doing a good job and i don't need it How same thing in fundraising so so you don't allow someone that's baggage so how do you call no, up, if how, the person say i don't want to work anymore or i don't feel okay or why don't you like that you see you're free you can go oh I, that's easy i'm talking about the ones who want to be on your coattail but are not doing their work? Uh, I may be not understanding uh, the situation. Well, someone, who, someone who's on your committee, who's decided to basically just ride your coattails and do no work, how do you deal with that person? If that, um, pers if that person is doing an overall, okay? If the person, for example, is uh, the person helping with fundraising, I needed a lot of money to do this exhibit. Okay, um, I needed that. No, 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 but wait, 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 wait. If, if that person is related to only one aspect and does this aspect properly, I don't care if they're- I agree. I'm talking and, about and, the person who does one thing, but it's not deciding that she's doing it. She just- I, I'm not uh, going to fire. I'm not going to fire. I don't have the power to fire. This person on their own is going to stay and not do what we expect. And it will have to be corrected, adjusted. Or this person will say, okay, you know, okay. bye. Okay, you mentioned, you mentioned the, my actual project, The Way Out of the Tree of Life. I had somebody Are by you, the name of Lee. Hold, hold on. Uh, I, want it's, to, I, I want to, believe it or not, we have hit our third 30 minute window. And so I am going to take a break here.
Uh, I'm Jeffrey Geisner, and I'm with Jackie Gamash. We're having a terrific discussion about Jackie's uh, turn to the Holocaust and the programs that she's putting together. And we're just about to really discuss her one of her passions that she's been devoting her life to for the last couple of years. Uh, we are the Trio Life Program. That's uh, it's a film uh, project that Jackie is totally invested in. And so this is Jeffrey Geisner for the Obligation of Memory podcast for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group on YouTube and Facebook. I will be back and we will be discussing We Are the Tree of Life with Jackie Gamash. Stay tuned. See you soon.